Thanks for coming out today. Let's uh, go to the Lord and worship here. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules a nation? With truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. Oh, that you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave, and worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave, and worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Oh, worthy, 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 this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love, that you would take my place. Oh, that you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. And good morning once again. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The psalmist reminds us of what a wonderful time. It's so good to worship with you today. We do have a number of folks who are not with us, but the spirit is strong here in our community of faith as we gather to praise the living God. Uh, again, just a reminder, every Sunday, you know, we're, I'm so glad to see people wearing masks or socially distancing themselves because that is really the only way that we are able to meet outside together in this setting. And will be the only way probably when we are able to go inside to be able to meet and to share and worship together there. We are um, really blessed that, that God has given us a good morning. Uh, I was just sitting there and the clouds were here and then a beam of sun came through the clouds and it made me think about how often our lives are that way. You know, things look cloudy and gray and then all of a sudden there's a light that gives us some hope and guidance in some direction. So God does that for us and with us. Let us pray as we begin, shall we? Almighty and everlasting God, we do indeed come before you this morning as your people. We thank you for the blessings of life that you have given to us, for your presence here with us. And we pray, Lord that uh, all that we do in this time, uh, that you would receive it gladly, that it would bring honor and glory to you through Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. 
Amen. The next song we're going to do is called Glorious Day. It's a song that talks about before we became in a relationship with Jesus Christ, we were pretty much buried in a tomb. And that day when he called our name, we ran out of the grave into his freedom. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb till I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all I know. The old maid knew. Jesus, when I met you, you called my name. darkness into your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness into your glorious day. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living Tasted and seen of the sweetest of love, where my heart becomes free and my chains are undone. Your presence, Lord, Holy Spirit, you are. and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord your presence Lord we 
you believe in him today? Amen. I've come to the there's more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're a living hope. Your presence, Lord. and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone oh, your presence Lord oh, Holy Spirit you are welcome Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. Be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness. Ooh, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for to be Amen, amen. And uh, all the people said, amen. amen. Thank you so much for that. And the Holy Spirit truly is here. What a special, sweet spirit there is among us this day. I want us to, again, gather our hearts and minds together in a time and attitude of prayer. So, um, Let's unite our spirits and unite our hearts in prayer. Shall we pray? Oh, great and creator God, the assurance of your love has given us the confidence to come before you and to bring to you the needs of this church family, of our friends, to bring before you the needs of our community, of our state, indeed the needs of our country, praying for the mission of the church throughout the world. For you, O oh God, are indeed the hope of all humankind. We ask today as we gather that you will pour out your mercy and your grace on us, that our hearts this day may be kindled with the warmth of your love. Grant us your vision, Father. Help us to see others as you see them and guide us daily by your spirit and your word of truth. Father, we pray that when we are discouraged, that you will lift our hearts, that when we are sorrowful and uncertain, you will give us compassion and comfort and peace. We pray, Lord, not only for these things, we pray for the life and the ministry of this, your church, First Baptist Church of Ypsilanti. We pray for its people. We pray for the search committee and their work. And we ask, Lord, that your will be done as the search for pastoral leadership continues. 
And Father, today in this moment of COVID, be to us a rock and indeed a refuge, one in whom we may find a sanctuary and rest as we face the challenges of this day. And in this time and in this place, we will give you the praise, the honor, and the glory now and always through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We have a very special guest filling in for Lori Zupan today. Megan Evans is going to minister us during offertory. Good. And if you have an offering this morning, please raise your hand and Scott will come around and receive it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, the scripture passage this morning is from the Gospel of John, and it's a very familiar passage, one known to us. It's the account of the coming of Nicodemus to meet with Jesus by night. And um, Nicodemus is a, a Pharisee, and I'll talk a little bit about this in the message, but uh, in first century Judaism, there were a number of competing parties that sought uh, to establish themselves uh, and with an authoritative interpretation of Judaism. One was the Pharisees, another was the Sadducees, another party uh, was the Herodians, the party of Herod. There were uh, Zealots who were a revolutionary party who sought to uh, provoke a revolt, revolt, um, revolt or rebellion against Rome. And there were a group who withdrew to an area south of the Dead Sea called the Essenes and to a community called Qumran. The Pharisees were a group, their brotherhood, that um, dedicated themselves to obeying the Mosaic law as perfectly as they could. Now, the scribes interpreted the law of Moses, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And the Pharisees were the ones who then obeyed this legal interpretation of what the law meant, how to apply it. And um, so a law that was given centuries before might not cover some areas of life today. Just in our Constitution and uh, founding documents, there's not a reference to euthanasia or abortion or anything like that. And so people, courts, have to decide how those founding documents interpret those moments. And so the same thing is going on here with the scribes and the Pharisees who now have the scribal interpretation of the law, uh, devote themselves to fulfilling it completely. So the man who comes to Jesus is a person of some standing in the religious community. He's a ruler of the Jews and a member of the Sanhedrin. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born anew, now some translations will say born again, um, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born anew, other translations will say from above, and I'll talk about that in the message. Unless one is born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? 
Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, that one cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born anew. The wind blows where it will, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes, or from whence it comes, or whither it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Holy Spirit. May God add his blessings to the reading of this, his holy word. Amen. We're going to introduce a song to you called Another in the Fire. This song, uh, my nephew who passed away um, this year, uh, we had a funeral a couple weeks back, uh, actually a celebration service, and we were asked to do some songs by my sister. And this is a song called Another in the Fire, as I said. And this talks about how when you're going through hard times, when you just don't feel like you're going to make it, when there's just so much weight on you that... God is always with you in the fire. He's standing right by you, and he always has been standing right by you. So uh, we hope this song ministers to you like it ministers to us. There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the waters Holding back the seas And should I ever need reminded Of how I've been set free There is a cross that bears the burden Where another died for me There is another in the fire All my dead left for dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore And should I fall in the space between What remains of me and this reckoning Either way I won't bow to the things of this world Oh yeah I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me There is another in the waters Holding back the seas And should I ever need reminding What power sets me free There is a grave that holds nobody now the power lives in me There's another in the fire Oh There's another in the fire Oh There's another in the fire Oh There's another in the fire I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him. And I can see the roar in the heavens as a space between west and I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls came in. And nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between us.
There is only the name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come with me in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. I know I will never be alone. There'll be another in the fire standing next to me. There'll be another in the waters holding back the sea. And should I ever need reminding how good you've been to me, I'll count the joy from every battle, cause I know that's where you'll be. Amen. That is uh, such a great word of encouragement to all of us to know that um, there is someone who is always with us when we're going through difficult moments. And I couldn't help but think for a moment, um, my mind gets a little too active at times, and um, I noticed a couple of folks walking on the sidewalk, and, and, uh, and here we are out in public, and they can hear us, and they can see us, and how often we uh, in churches go inside buildings. But when you're out in the public, people passing by have to take notice of you, don't they? I mean, they have to hear you, they see you, and then they have to make a decision about whether they want to uh, explore uh, that or not. Uh, and we need buildings, for sure. Uh, there is, I think, such a concept as sacred space. And there is certainly a need in the middle of January to be inside <laughs> as opposed to being outside. I have, um, <clears throat> today, doing a passage on Nicodemus and I've been actually dawned on me the other day that I've done a series an informal series on people in the Gospel of John who have encounters with Jesus and one is uh, the Samaritan woman at the well whose life is changed by that encounter and another one is the man by the pool in Bethsatha whose life is changed by that encounter then there was the man the little boy uh, with the disciples and the feeding of the 5,000 and today we discover uh, another man, the man that I introduced to you earlier, Nicodemus. And we see him in this encounter with Jesus, only now um, he's a person who comes to Jesus and not someone to whom Jesus meets or goes uh, himself. And in the course of this conversation, we have a, a discussion from Jesus about the meaning of new birth, of a change, of a regeneration, in life, uh, regeneration of the soul that brings men and women into fellowship with God. And we see at the beginning, as I read to you in the passage, that Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. It may be that as a man of st some standing in the religious community of his day, and given the um, popularity Jesus has, but also the opposition he has generated, that there is the possibility that he doesn't want to be seen with Jesus in this more intimate setting. The rabbis taught the best time to study the Torah, the law, was at night. And so it also may be an assumption by Nicodemus that there would not be as many people around Jesus and he could have this conversation with him. So he comes to Jesus at night. And as I mentioned, he is a powerful religious person, a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin or basically the Supreme Court uh, for Judaism uh, throughout the world. And it's a conversation in his background, his obedience to the law. We have to understand just the context of the law for a moment. The law, as we use that term in the New Testament, is a reference to the first five books of the Old Testament, which are called the Torah. But it isn't law in the same sense that we think about law, statutory law. It's more divine guidance and instruction on how to live as God's people that comes down to Moses uh, in Exodus and then through Leviticus and Numbers and um, the first five books of the Old Testament. And as I mentioned, there comes a need to interpret the law. And so the role of the scribes emerge as legal interpreters of how the law works. 
And the, uh, what was, the law was so sacred to the Jews that to add a word to it or subtract a word from it would be a deadly sin. And one rabbi a century or two before said, we must build a fence around the law. And that's where these regulations come into play. To build a fence is to keep people from entering into and violating the law. So it's an effort for them to try to live more faithful lives, but it became very difficult for them to actually do that, to uh, honor the Sabbath, to keep it holy, and to do no work. Well, what did that mean? Well, traveling on the Sabbath was considered work. But you could make a trip of a thousand cubits, which is a cubit is 18 inches, so you could travel 1,500 yards. Well, if you put a rope at the end of the street, then you're, that extends your house to the end of that rope. So if you wanted to go outside the town another 1,500 yards, you could do it that way. Uh, tying a knot on the Sabbath was considered work. You could not tie a knot that a camel driver would tie. You cannot tie a knot that a sailor would tie. But if you could tie or untie a knot with one hand, that was perfectly legal. And so the scribes describe what is legal and what is not. And so the Pharisees are dedicated to obeying the law as interpreted by the scribes. And so Nicodemus, this man with a strong reverence for the teachings associated with the Torah, the law, comes to Jesus at night. And I can only imagine that in this conversation, I, the, to my mind, what I think he's trying to do, and you can imagine yourself, is to find a way to fit this clearly authentic man of God into the teachings that he has received and has been following. How does Jesus mesh with everything that he has learned and to which he has devoted his life? I can only imagine that he's trying to fit Jesus into, uh, and the work of Jesus into his understanding of the law and how the law offers guidance. But there are some important things for us to note in this conversation. And I want us to take a look at them. That Nicodemus comes to Jesus and says, Rabbi, we know that you are a man who's come from God because no one can do the great things that you're doing unless God is with him. And Jesus immediately doesn't respond and say, hey, that's really good insight. You nailed it. That's exactly right. No, he doesn't say that. He says, truly, truly, I say to you that unless a man is born anew, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so Nicodemus then wants to know, well, how can a person, a, a full grown man, re-enter his mother's womb? And then Jesus says, well, this comes about through the spirit. But what I want to focus on for a moment is where the confusion comes from. And it comes from this phrase, in the English Bible translated, unless a person, a man, is born again, that um, I, I'm going to ask you to bear with me for a little bit of Greek, okay? I don't want to make this too tedious for you, but it's an important point. The verb born is a verb, uh, no, let me back up, again is anothen. That's the Greek word for again, anothen. But anothen has three meanings. One is originally completely radical. That's one meaning of anothen. Another meaning is again or anew. And then the third meaning is from above, which means of God. Now, there's no way that all three of those meanings can be fit into that one word. And so in my mind, when Jesus says, unless a person is born anew or again, Nicodemus is thinking of a physical birth. But what Jesus is talking about is not a physical birth, but a spiritual birth. He is not speaking about being born again physically a second time. He is talking about being born from above for the first time. And so the confusion for Nicodemus is, I think, at that point. And so it's almost like Nicodemus is saying, when he asks, how can a man enter a mother's womb the second time? He, he's not really questioning the necessity for a change. He's not really questioning the necessity for transformation. He's not really questioning the necessity for regeneration. He really is questioning whether it's possible. Can it happen? Can it happen? And he talks about, he says in a sense to Jesus, putting words in the mouth of Nicodemus, you talk about being born anew, about a radical fundamental change that is necessary. I know it's necessary, 
But in my experience, it is impossible. There's nothing I want more, but you might as well tell a full-grown man to re-enter his mother's womb to be born again. It's not the desirability of change, I question. It is the possibility. And here, Nicodemus faces the age-old problem that all of us face at one time or another. The person who wants to change but cannot change himself or herself. So, when one is, the word born is an interesting verb because it's also used in um, what I could call agricultural Greek to refer to the siring uh, by a bull of a calf with a cow. And so, in essence, if we kind of take a more kind of rough hewn definition of what Jesus is saying, he's saying, unless you are sired from above unless God does this to you gives you this gift it won't happen and this is then for you and I in this first instance this new birth is a gift from God it is the unmerited favor of God who comes to us in Jesus Christ it is the grace of God who gives us this gift of new life and it's not something that you and I can do for ourselves if you were to look at the first chapter of John's gospel in chapter 1 in the prologue in verses uh, 10 through 13 he's talking about the word who came in the world he was in the world and the world was made through him and yet the world knew him not he came to his own home and his own people received him not but to all who received him who believed in his name he gave power to become the children of God. Who received his name, he gave power to become the children of God. But listen to verse 13. These people to whom he gave power to become children of God were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but they were born of God. And so this new birth that Jesus is talking about is an action that we can't perform for ourselves, but that God performs for us. It is our gift of new life, the possibility of transformation, of fellowship with God, and regeneration. So secondly, the new birth does not mean, and I want to make be clear about this. I thought about this for a long time. I, I grew up in a Baptist church in the South at a period where I didn't um, follow the Lord and kind of wandered my own way, and then came back into the faith back in 1969. And um, so I grew up with the idea, uh, this, this imagery of being born again all the time that was in the air and in the sermons and in the books and, and in the Sunday school class. But I want to say to you all this morning that this new birth, this born again thing, does not mean one has to have a dramatic experience because I have known people in the churches where I have pastored, people who can never remember a day when that person was not a Christian. They were raised in the faith, in the home, and at church. They remember their baptism and their declaration of intent to live for Christ, which I liken to the ripening of a fruit on the vine which is long developing but now is mature and is grasping the deeper meaning of all the stories that they heard. Everyone has a journey and all journeys are not the same and we can't get in the position of squeezing people into the same mold so that we can have confirmation for ourselves. Jesus says, um, the spirit blows where it will and no one knows exactly how the wind of the Spirit will move in someone's life. Each person's journey is as unique as that person is unique. So the proof of Christianity lies less in a specific moment in time and feeling, less in a specific feeling. Christianity reveals itself over a lifetime of living for and with Christ in the words and deeds of the person who calls himself or herself a Christian. What Christ represents to you and to me is what the law cannot do. The law cannot fulfill itself. The law requires an agency or an agent to fulfill it. But the law can't do it itself. 
We know the law has authority in our lives, but the law can't complete it. It depends upon our obedience. So if you see the stop sign over there, you stop. Why do you stop? Because you know you could get a ticket. You could be seen. There is an authority associated with that traffic signal that you respect because you don't want to get a ticket and you don't want to pay the fine. So the law can't fulfill itself. It depends upon our obedience. And, the, and the, the point is that we cannot be perfect enough to keep it in every instance. And Paul says, though you keep the whole law and stumble at one point, you're guilty of breaking it all. So Jesus does for us by living the life he lives, what the law cannot do for us and what we cannot do for ourselves. He completes the work that Nicodemus so scrupulously tried to follow. So this new birth is from God, and this new birth is as unique as each person is unique. And then finally, I want to say that um, the, new the new birth, the door to the kingdom, requires moving from admiring Jesus to joining Jesus in his redemptive work. Chris is, um, <laughs> Chris is reading a book, I think Chuck has read it, called Not a Fan. And um, the book makes the distinction between being an ardent uh, fan of Christ um, and, and saying that if you're a fan of Christ, it's like being a fan of a football team, uh, U of M or Michigan State or Eastern Michigan. It's about moving. Um, it's about moving from watching in the stands to being out on the field in the game, in the action, following the game plan which has been worked out by God in Christ. And so if you want to know what that game plan is, the clearest and most succinct version of it can be found in Matthew 5 through 7, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Paul writes that the law is given to us as a custodian to bring us to Christ and that in Christ we find the freedom that God means for us to have in the life that he gives to us. So that being born from above is a gift of God's grace. It comes to all who seek to know God more fully, to know God's love and forgiveness more completely, and to live for God in the full and abundant life that Christ brings to us. Chris has, for the last couple of years, been um, raising butterflies. She has a mesh cylinder, and then she bought a larger mesh, mesh cylinder, and then she bought a whole manor of mesh cylinders for butterflies. But she brings in milkweed leaves, and on the leaves are, are eggs that become caterpillars, and then they eat the um, milkweed. And our grandchildren love this. And then the caterpillar sheds the skin and forms a chrysalis and hangs. They have a little attachment on the end that they hook on and they weave silk around it and they hang there until finally they move out of the chrysalis and they're in this mesh cylinder. But their wings are limp. They, they haven't filled yet, so they can't fly right away. But it is an amazing feeling. I'm 74 years old and I sat, stood in the backyard and watched her open that mesh cylinder with Mary Helen and Chloe, our grandchildren, and saw that butterfly rise out of that cylinder and begin to soar into the sky the first steps of new life. That's what being born anew from above is about. About releasing the things that have held us back and soaring into the space that God has given to us. Let us pray. Father, we do indeed thank you for being with us this day and for helping us to live the new life that you've called us to live. Continue to guide us, we pray in your son's name. Amen. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou Christ
shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou And now may this great and holy God go with you this day and all days. And may the blessings of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and those whom you love now and forever. Amen. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul. God bless you all, and a special thank you to Megan and to uh, David and to Becky for the music today. And uh, be, have a blessed day. Amen.